All right. So um, thank you all for tuning in to this reading. And of course, thanks to the amazing group of readers we have here tonight. Again, this is an oddly titled, we we're talking about it earlier, an oddly titled reading series started off as a kind of a joke. I was stubbornly refusing to learn a new video conferencing program for teaching. So I signed up for Zoom Pro and figured why not use that as an opportunity to I don't know, bring some amazing poets together and have them share their work. A little bit of a joke, a little bit of stubbornness, but it kind of worked out. So tonight we have Jessica Q. Stark, Christopher Citro, Issam Zene, Noah Falk, and Mary Bittinger. And they will each read, you know, obviously in that order. And if you want, you know, we have the chat, which is the nice thing about Zoom. So if you want to, I don't know, yell out any kind of encouragement, yell out lines you like, artificially clap in some way, definitely go ahead and do that. And we'll get started right about now. Our first reader is Jessica Q. Stark, who is a poet and educator living in Jacksonville, Florida. Her first full-length poetry collection was Savage Pageant. It was published by Birds LLC in March 2020 and was named one of the best poetry books of 2020 in the Boston Globe and in Hyperallergic. She is the author of three poetry chapbooks, including Internet, which was out from The Offending Adam in 2021. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Pleiades, The Boiler, Poetry Daily, Verse, Carolina Quarterly, Wildness, Hobart, Tupelo Quarterly, Glass Poetry Journal, and others. She served as a poetry editor for Agni and the comics editor for Honey Literary. She teaches writing at the University of North Florida. Thanks Thank so much. You, Jessica. Um, I wasn't planning on sharing anything, but it is a, I'm going to be reading from a manuscript that is hybrid. So last minute, I think I'll share maybe one of the images um, from, from the manuscript that accompanies um, these poems. Um, so thanks so much to David. I can't wait to hear all of these readers. Um, I'm so excited for tonight. So thank you. Um, I'm going to read from a manuscript that I finished last year. It's called Buffalo Girl. It focuses mostly on um, my mother, a very complicated and beautiful person who immigrated um, to the United States from Vietnam in 1975. Uh, in, in this one, in this manuscript, I also explore different iterations of a very familiar story called Little Red Riding Hood and its various endings, most of which center around um, some kind of punishment for a young girl's curiosities, many of them sexually imbued in my research. Um, in these poems, I, I think I'm interested in thinking about beauty and, and cruelty and how they live in a human body as a symptom of survival. And while I was writing it, I was also thinking about different kinds of monsters in woods, thinking about different kinds of hunger specifically inherited hunger and thinking about whispers around sex work and relatedly inverting stories of diasporic victimhood. I have six poems for you tonight and I'm gonna mostly go straight through. So thanks for listening. This first one is an erasure and it's called Little Red Hood after A.H. Ratislaw. Once upon a time, a darling damsel said, I will observe the latch. And with that, everything looked so strange. Oh, how frightened I have been. It was so dark in the wolf's maw. Hungry poem with laughter coming from an unknown source. She's still there the further you look back. I mean before the war and the wolves and the other war and the French and her departure and even the Chinese. I mean that far back. 
And since I'm talking about my mother, let's talk a hair down, cat-eyed perfection, heels on a borrowed Vespa kind of laughter, filling whole highways with her eyeliner, another kind of laughter, and a deep belly laugh at the thought of the Chung sisters ever jumping from a single thing besides the time it takes my mother to flip the switch on a boring conversation with a dick joke. What did she say? I mean, keep up. I mean that far back when Vietnam knew a world could be best run by women and more women with still more laughter charging the void, a still life silt, a nitty knot of a lump in the throat, that sensation between choking and uncontrollable heaving laughter at the very thing that controls you and your body and your mother's body and my sisters. My dear sisters, we always had laughter for our bodies that kept planting deeper into the woods ground cover. Insert cut scene, rescind the fairy tale. We all know there are no true villains. We're just a bunch of hungry animals. I would jump with you. I would, I would give it all for you. Laughter at sundown, laughter at the feet crushing statuary, laughter until our very last word on this dying earth that just keeps turning and turning its silhouette shadow figures slipping back into human skin at dawn. This next one is the uh, titular poem. It's called Buffalo Girl. It's dedicated um, to my mother, as well as Xu Thi Chen, who was a Vietnamese uh, female warrior um, in Vietnamese folklore based loosely on fact. Buffalo Girl. History makes little bundles out of the unthinkable. Young boys carve three foot breasts to keep your story otherworldly and ridiculous. A crisp blade slips from view. We stand at the Albertsons customer service and I hold my breath as you ready a well-worn trap. Discount oversight, grave mistake. A set of eyes exhaust and I almost feel for our opposing force who does not know the survival of ants under glass. Long after your death, you haunted soldiers' dreams. The Chinese commander that slayed you built fallacies to try to keep you still. Poor men and their fantasies of time and blood that move only during the duration of war. Victory painted the parking lot lucky red. In every windshield, I swear I saw the glint of slow storm in your eyes. History books are forever missing the details of unfathomable loss, providing discounts on overstocked goods. You are my mother, minor warrior who has never needed saving who has never needed memory to make a home, a good home, alone in the woods. The woods. Name, mame, mama, mama, mame, name, mama, mama, oh, oh, oh. If you knew how much woods I own, how much now woods I know, you might turn straight into stone. Astounded, your face like love, folding me back down into an incomplete set of flowers. I got two more for you. There's a number of, you know, as I mentioned before, there's a number of different contours with this this manuscript um, and some aspects involve this like deep love I have for my mother, for my sisters of this kind of magic and, and generational tenacity. And, and then other aspects involve a great deal of blood and rage around the terms of my mother's departure from Vietnam and therefore the rage around the terms of my own existence. Um, and this next poem is called The Furies. The Furies. That the Furies sprang forth from the blood of castration. That the confession didn't bring back the hometown. That departure never crossed out the stars. 
that the word Edeneus is of uncertain etymology that most tragic things are, that the punisher of the moral crime, infidelity, murder must bear the burden, that Eurydice was never asked where she'd prefer to stay, that the woods obscure as much as they protect that at least you can lay there, that there are so few public places to exhibit pain. That the image of the image of my mother in Vietnam is a birth certificate that doesn't exist. That I don't know her in her mother tongue. That I don't know my mother's mother in any tongue. That this too means loss. That this too means woods. That I can't write about that war without my face. That my mother is always worried about her heart. That the violent general is decorated. That most powerful men are sexually perverse that there's no accounting for punishment, that punishment isn't justice for deletion, that punishment could never be satisfactory, ejaculatory, a pretty show dog's head on a stake. That I put it in a book in order to bloodshot my own eyes, brass studded scourge in my hands. Thanks for listening, I got one more for you. New world ghost story. Here lies the house that she traded for blood, that the siblings still fight over, the domicile that repels division. Of course, it would be filled with white ghosts inside and white ghosts outside, calling about the white fence about the way of telling you that this is about the time Unwai laughed in the face of a ghost that pressed nightly on his chest. He was so full up of it. Terror repeated long enough becomes pure comedy. And what else can you do but laugh? and laugh about the time the nuns on bicycles shouted, slur, shouted slurs against the new neighbors taking, or the time that I wandered into the backyard and finally knew a dead thing, or how Unwai, out of nostalgia and spite, snapped the neck of the chicken he kept right there on the front lawn for our supper without pause, luck unraveling in his raspy hands. On the sidewalk, a pair of mistaken ghosts mounted their bloody bicycles, mouthed, oh, 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 and fled. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Jessica. What an absolutely powerful way of starting us off. Um, I am using the chat to put up links to the reader's books. So definitely check those out. Let's see. Next up, we have Christopher Citra, who is the author of If We Had Lemon, If We Had a Lemon, We'd Throw It and Call That the Sun, out from Elixir Press this year, uh, winner of the 2019 Anti Venom Poetry Award. And he's also the author of The Maintenance of the Shimmy Shammy from Steel Toe Books in 2015. His honors include a 2018 Pushcart Prize for Poetry, a 2019 Fellowship from the Ragdale Foundation, Columbia Journal's Poetry Award, and a Creative Nonfiction Award from the Florida Review. His poetry appears in Alaska Quarterly Review, American Poetry Review, Best New Poets, Gulf Coast, Iowa Review, Plowshares, West Branch, and elsewhere. He lives in Syracuse, New York. Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you, David, for inviting me to read tonight, making all this happen. This is definitely the most awesome use of a Zoom Pro account that I've ever heard of. <laughs> Thank you to my fellow readers. It's an honor to read with you all. It's an honor to read after you, Jessica. That was amazing. An honor to read with you, Noah, and Mary, and Isam. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you to everybody out there watching in the Zoomosphere. My name's Christopher, and I'd like to read you some poems. So I'm going to be reading you. To, I'm going to be reading to you from my new book. If we had a lemon, we'd throw it and call that the sun. This first poem um, has an epigraph by Heather Crystal from her poem Taxonomy of that November, and the epigraph reads: "We were happy and wretched and cloudy." and setting fire to everything for warmth. And the poem is called, It's Something People in Love Do. 
It's a late film, not one of their best, clogged with a love interest that never really makes your pants itch. But when the Marx Brothers keep the train moving so the hero can make it to town to record the deed and afford to marry the girl of his dreams, they chop the whole damn train up to feed the fire. Frightened passengers in bustles and waistcoats watch their seats axed from beneath them as women cradle their children and men stand around looking affronted. Then they hack up the walls and the roofs, carrying armfuls of train forward to turn into steam, to keep things moving. And I'm not saying we should watch fewer old movies. What I am saying is maybe everything's not a metaphor for trying to pay the bills on time. I love your credit score. It could pin my credit score to the late summer soil and pee on its head. My credit score would roll over and take it. But what do you think of that chicken dinner I made last night? How caramelized the thighs, the bourbon from a plastic jug. How beautiful that farmhouse looks passing by in the distance. If we could get off this train, we could go get it and tear it to pieces with our teeth, tossing hallways and lintels to the flames. Then we could clean each other's face with our tongues. It's called kissing. People in love do it. And uh, this is called, the people who live near us are our neighbors. It used to have the word unfortunately at the end, but I thought that was probably too much. Two doors down, the neighbor kid hung a white wire reindeer with twinkle lights from a tree as if freshly shot and ready for butchery. It's pleasing to live so near the country, the trees, the rolling hills and apple stands, but it does mean you have to put up with gunshots into the scrubland on winter evenings. Some nights there's a patrol car parked out front. We wish him and his family the best. We eat popcorn because it's all natural and sort of old fashioned and brings us a little closer to the life of the soil. The life of the soil is nearby, past the gas station on 57, up the road from the dog park, across the intersection from where the guy lost control and slammed into a mother of three. He was driving to McDonald's. It said that on the news report. He'd smoked the heroin just before heading out for his Tuesday dinner, his little silver cloud rising above us all, the dead reindeer made of lights, the popcorn, the gradual inconsistencies, and the fields someone still plows and tends and pulls pumpkins from when the morning dew gives gradually way to frost. I write a lot of poems about shopping. I don't know why. And so this is, uh, this is a dollar store poem. It's called Anyway and Try to Stay Alive on What It Gives Us. The off-brand dollar store sticky notes adhere to each other, great. To anything else in this world, less great, like us. Sometimes it feels like the back of a big box store in here, my head. When you walk up to that wall of TVs all showing the same scenes, it's huge, but it's also lots of little not huge things. You know how we sound like idiots when we try to say important things? Well, me at least. Going shopping together is like living our lives together. Please don't tell me about how they sprayed to kill mosquitoes, forgetting to warn the beekeepers, and the bodies are so high the numbers themselves look obscene. All those zeros, all those empty holes in the honeycomb, I'm going to lose it next to the mustard with a label just like a leading national brand. Until you look closely, that is, there are words there but not the ones we need. I used to have a dumb office job in downtown Syracuse. I don't have that job anymore, but I do have this poem. <laughs> this is called, You Can Keep Your Employee of the Month Award. I need to work out a way to keep my rowboat with me, even at work. Double the amount of productivity you expect me to crank out, 
sure, if I can do it standing in my rowboat, looking out into the distance for a heron nest inside the cottonwoods. Am I working quickly enough? Let me know when you get the chance. I'll be floating along the shore, watching midges form new constellations against a sky so blue it makes your eyes squeak. I'm going to have to clock in at the start of my day and clock out before leaving. Just make sure the button can be operated by one end of an oar, with me holding onto the other, leaning out of, but still firmly seated in, my rowboat. Dreaming of lime trees is the name I've just decided my boat will be called. I'm probably a thousand miles from the nearest lime tree, but the sparkling water I just sipped is lime flavored. And that got me thinking. You'd never accept that sort of non-linear thinking from an employee, but I did it on my break. Paddling out toward the open water, enjoying my muscles waking up inside my shirt, the tang of fresh air forcing its way into my nostrils, in 15 minutes, I'll be back, I know you find that hard to believe, at my desk, in my chair, at my computer, with my eyes doing what you pay me to have them do. I will. And when I wobble a little, it's because a rowboat in an office is going to wobble a little. And now a sonnet. <laughs> Um, the kind of a sonnet that isn't written in meter and doesn't rhyme, but I'm calling it a sonnet. It's, uh, it's called Smell of Wet Earth Like the Inside of My Hands. When I step outside, I want the raindrops pressing me a little deeper with each falling. I might meet our spinning nickel center, shining a dark light, wet overcoat of itself, and I want the wild azalea above to speak one good sentence in my life worthy of carving into a pine. One of those waiting in an elementary school playground where they still want the kids to have a tree. So they paved right up to the bark on that one. I go to the drugstore sometimes just to watch us, the hesitation in the ill lit aisle. Who buys a loaf of bread at Rite Aid? I do. You're waiting at home. You're hungry. And uh, this next poem is the title poem of my uh, collection. And it also starts with an epigraph. I got a little epigraph happy. Um, this is by Gerald Stern from his poem, Red Wool Bathrobe. And the epigraph reads, and that was one thing quickly becoming another. And this is, if we had a lemon, we'd throw it and call that the sun. I'd like to invite you to the party, but I don't know your name, have your address, or know you well enough to really want you around my cat. I feel a kinship with all people. Then I share a beach with them and want to yell, use your inside voice. We're outside, but that doesn't mean we'll not dissolve if raised to the light. Some days the sea wants to chew us into shattered two by fours. Some days she's a kitten pasting soft hairs around our ankles. I know, I know this for a fact, there are moist pasta salads being prepared and eaten all around me, in those bushes, for instance, and I'm not getting any. I tried to start my life out right and still lost track of where I was going. Example, I picked my college because my girlfriend went there. She slept with my best friend. I went there anyway. That determined the course of the rest of my life. I wiped the table down with bleach before sitting, and now my forearm smells. It's gonna be okay though. I'm gonna need this bleach arm for some purpose. To identify some wanderers in the sky, it's helpful to determine the color. At a distance, everything for me goes gray, a mountain range in a black and white film. We've been walking, my horse and I, for days. For water, we think about rivers and lick our own ideas. And this is my last poem. Thanks for listening, everybody. Um, this is called Our Beautiful Life 
when it's filled with shrieks. I'm doing a balancing act with a stack of fresh fruit in my basket. I love you. I want us both to eat well. We're not allowed to buy blackberries anymore because they're mean to their workers and you read left-wing news sites. Till when, I asked, and you said nothing. So that's one healthy food off the list. I'm still buying pineapples and you're still eating them. I guess you've never seen the websites about those. Nobody in this supermarket knows that I am a puma. This morning, our cat rolled on the floor, showing me her belly, which I leaned down and rubbed. Beneath a backyard pine tree, the neighbor's cat was eating one of our cat's moles, at least the moles we rent from the landlord for her. It's so complicated staying alive sometimes. The voices of the collection agencies on the answering machine sound menacing. They're paid to sound that way, and they're not paid much more than the people they're menacing, which can get you thinking if you're the sort who likes to think about that sort of thing. Other people subscribe to adventure cycling magazines and read about men who rode across Turkey in the late 1800s before anything was happening in the world, before cantaloupes probably existed, when you could get an honest wage for an honest day's blackberries, when we loved like fierce mountain storms with the blood of eagles in our hearts, exchanging grocery lists that just said, you, 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 you all the way down. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Off the second, Jessica in the chat there, and your endings are always so fantastic. Well, thank you. All right, next up, we have Issam Zene, who is the author of the forthcoming poetry collection, Unceded Land, which is coming out next year from Trio House Press. It was the editor's selection and a finalist for the TRIO Award for first or second book. He is also the author of the chapbook, The Moment of Greatest Alienation. His poems appear or are forthcoming in Agni, Guernica, Gulf Coast, Pleiades, Tahoma Literary Review, and elsewhere. You can find him online at isamzaneh.com or on Twitter at I-Z-I-N-E-H. I'll throw that in the chat so people can find you. Well, um, thanks so much, David. And it's so great to be here alongside everyone. Wow, uh, Jessica and Chris, my heart is just exploding. And I'm very eager to hear Noah and, and Mary as well. So let's just get this out of the way. Um, <clears throat> the last poem I write, On our trip to the Dead Sea, my daughter couldn't stop crying because the salt content was so high, it burned her vagina. My best friend refuses to write about flowers, but feels it's acceptable to write about trees because of the more serious nature of the subject matter. There's a moral obligation in poetry not to pass on cruelty through the poem itself, yellow bird magnolia. My daughter asks when I will put the tree swing up. Il Bustan is Arabic for the garden. Rob Nixon calls the inattention we have paid to the attritional lethality of many crises slow violence. He means this in the context of ecological catastrophe. The Arabic word for catastrophe is Nakba. The flowers in the vase are white lysianthus and heather. In the Ilbustan neighborhood of Silwan, 13 families face home demolition to make way for a religious theme park where some believe King David owned a garden. A major concern with the lyric eye is whether the reader can empathize. Did you know David Jackson's funeral photo of Emmett Till first appeared in Jet Magazine? The word magazine comes from the Arabic mechzen, which means storehouse. There's a moral obligation in poetry not to pass on cruelty through the poem itself. 
I should take the line about my uncle burning newborn mice out of the poem I wrote earlier this week. In the last poem I write, we pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill. There's a provision for planting crepe myrtles along the interstate. The problem with taking it out altogether as I see it is that it fails to consider intention. There's a moral obligation in poetry not to pass on cruelty through the poem itself. I really should take the line about my uncle burning newborn mice out of the poem I wrote earlier this week. Herbs gathered under the shade of frail acacias. Or maybe I can turn it into a question. That second to last line uh, from that poem is from Wade Davis's just remarkable uh, book, The Wayfinders. Uh, my friend challenged me to write a poem without any birds in it, and I uh, failed spectacularly on this next poem. Uh, this is Unhoused Ghazal. Start with an animal, but not a bird, a buffalo, and exterminate it. Think not a bird. Think policy or practice. I met the new neighbor. He was hauling bags of grub killer. The crows have been tearing up the lawn. In his words, this is an act of spiritual reciprocity. Think hawk, and by that alone, we have animated the land. The sun tipped their arrows with sun-dried grub guts let fly like birds, arrows toward a kind of kind exhaustion. The first kill is transcribed in the skin. The father slits the son's side with bird bone, rubs meat and fat into the wound, scars the body, right side for buck, left side for doe. Every bird has a name, the least articulate default to color and body white-browed, yellow-billed, gray-backed. Some birds impale their prey on thorns. Some people feel the more appropriate word is unhoused. You remind me of the swallows that return each year to the same mission. This has become our cosmology. Promise you'll leave me behind when it's time unburden, surround my body with thorn scrub, light a fire at my feet, let me listen to the distance, birds, and just beyond them, more birds. <clears throat> Some. Turn the lights down low, for the Lord has multiplied my love. I have waited in secret and silence in dark places, in the city's thighs, and he has not shown. This is the point of quiet exclamation. He is not addiction. He is not brutality, not the semi-automatic, not the talk, 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 talk of joy or resistance, not Elysium, not Elysian. He is not the limelight, not the announcing volcano. He is not a sword or funnel. He is not the glad loin or gladiolus. He is not the gold lion in the den. I have waited for him with head cocked, dribbled into his cup and picks. He is not the place to begin. You are your body whispers between mine and the most highs. I forget the unholy God whose name is excellent. By you, I have known the beauty of the blaspheme. You give meaning, my conceit. You are all deliverance, tip, speech. Gestures of devotion must be big if we expect to be seen. The sky in clear water is the print of your dress, all aster and blue starling. The year ends the way it began. 
you asking me for the indescribable sky has no notion of sky. For all you're looking up, your dreams, the ones you share as the light breaks, happen on earth. We are at the bottom of a drained ocean. The sky is burnt orange and raw sienna. There's a monastery built into a mountain. You whisper, the monks will let a woman in before they let in a Protestant. I put a jade egg in your mouth and it becomes night. Every time you ask what the sky is like where I am now, I feel like I answer wrong, so I practice. Every day, write down answers to questions you haven't asked yet. The Inuit have a word that means both weather and consciousness. No one from the Holy Land calls it the Holy Land. I have one more. Thanks everybody for, for, for showing up. Obad for darker sensibilities. You are not the first person to ask me what it feels like to come inside them. I've kept a running list of answers for moments like this for years. I usually start with, oh God, how do I answer that? Then a niche, a glittering, a lamp, the light of the likeness, an oil star kindled, no fire, well night, a tree, an olive that is, a glass. I also do this with questions one might consider more substantive and relevant to the current situation. For example, is it possible to love two people at the same time might get you, for a long time, the heart was composed, the core copied from the large perfection, the heart surviving the original term. We lose track of suffering. We become. Can I start over? In this poem, we see a clear example of the I and the you co-arriving with the text. In fact, it would not be surprising to learn the poem's original title was simply Obad. Every joyful story you tell me lately has a man in it and an animal and fabric. There's a community garden where one can touch the green thing others have touched. The saddest stories are always of kids. They have men in them too, and grief. I mean, grief, grief. I have no sense of smell in my dreams. You taste like buckets of clear water with pennies in them. The closest beach is a short ride away. We can leave in the morning. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank you so much, Assam. Do you know when in 2022 your book's gonna be available? Uh, it's slated for the summer, June or July. All right, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, if you go to the uh, link in the chat, you can sign up to be notified when, uh, when pre-orders are up, I guess. Excellent. So our next reader is Noah Falk, who is the author of Exclusions, which was the finalist for the 2020 Believer Book Prize for Poetry. His work has appeared in Kenyan Review, Literary Hub, Poetry Daily, and Poets.org. He lives in Buffalo, New York, where he works as the education director at Just Buffalo Literary Center and curates the Silo City Reading Series, a multimedia poetry series inside a 130 foot high abandoned grain silo where poetry is meant to be read. Indeed, thank you, David. Thanks for creating this space. These spaces are so necessary, I think, in an ongoing way uh, necessary for us to sort of share our work. It's, it's just been amazing so far. I sort of don't want to read and just sort of want to end the night right now, but um, I also want to hear Mary. So thank you guys so much. I'm just going to read six poems. Um, um, 
five exclusion poems and then one new poem. Poem excluding gun control. Every morning begins with the saddest story ever told. The neighborhood kids pull triggers between gasps of laughter. Birds fall from the sky one at a time. And we wake to someone's conclusion, to a rhapsody, a trumpet cry of sirens, as far as tomorrow goes, it's too far away. But you will be there in the middle, trembling. We can say that much, tightening our belts, metal purring against our legs. We understand this may be our last day to speak of love to choke on pistachios on porches with old friends. For the girl with eyes so brown, they could be countries scarred with the richest of soil. Poem excluding death. The heart is the most donated organ, she began her lecture. You listened intently with your painted face. You thought of heaven, thought of all the possible regions, the region of common nosebleeds, the region of detective dialogue, the region of hospital haircuts, the region of invisible friends, the region of fancy candy dishes, the region where science is understood as fact. Poem excluding opposite day. Every thought you have becomes the future tattoos of sad children in federally funded after school programs. The river gets a life and then burns. People wait in line to give blood to devour the future. Bird songs carved through the air until sunset. It's always December in the next chapter of your life. Your thoughts slowly replaced by freezing rain. Poem excluding answers. Someone spends her entire life dreaming of how it will end. It makes her sad. We sail a small boat within her heart and discover another heart. Though it looks more like a moon lit from within by a single exploding bottle rocket. It's got two more. Poem excluding air quotes. These are air quotes. Actually, these are air quotes. <clears throat> Start with how your father died. In the hospital, his legs couldn't even whisper beneath the thin sheets. You sat in a plastic chair 
and took in a view of the parking garage. The hallway was busy with the occasional sound of toddlers chasing balloons, of nurses, fake smiles. You decorated his bedside with a get well card from an ex-wife, a tall glass of ice water. When he passed, you wondered how many people had died in this room on this bed, at this time of night, when the darkness was making a meal of the world. It was a newer, newish, new poem, new. It's called Mistakes on Purpose. That. Thanks again for, for having me here in this space. I like reading poems. I like hearing poems. I like reading poems. Mistakes on purpose. Did you know the shadows played the part of sadness in the decade before we met? And the trees swooned slow like a secret between old lovers. You got better with age was the mood I was in that afternoon on the Hudson. Maybe an emptiness made out of October I couldn't apologize for. Or that long drive into the middle of the state where all the flags hung like fire. I remember standing in a room the color of dropped pennies, holding hands with strangers in masks. Midnight came and went. We stood still together, part darkness, part sky. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you so much, Noah. Absolutely beautiful poems. Our uh, final reader, Mary Bittinger, her newest collection is Department of Elegy, which is forthcoming from Black Lawrence Press next month, actually, January 2022. Her poetry and flash fiction have recently appeared in Bennington Review, Crazy Horse, Diagram, Gone Lawn, which is a, a great name for a journal, and Thrush Poetry Journal, among others. She lives in Akron, Ohio, where she teaches and edits the Akron series in poetry at the University of Akron Press. She is currently at work on a flash fiction novella that chronicles the adventures of grad school roommates in late 1990s Chicago. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, David, thank you for welcoming us for this. I had no idea how much I needed this today. Um, I don't know if anybody else is feeling the same way. Thank you to Noah, thank you to Isam, thank you to Christopher and to Jessica. I feel so inspired. Like, I, this is kind of reminding me why I like poems. You know what I mean? Like you get to a point where you're like poetry, why? But now I just wanna go write but I'm too tired. So anyway, thank you so much for this space. I'm going to share a link in the chat and hopefully it will work. Um, this is a link to my website. Um, and if you are interested in getting an accessibility document, I have there a standard and large print version, um, like in the PDFs in the post where you could grab um, copies of some of the poems. I am not going to read all of the poems, but I like to just put some poems there in case that can be helpful. Um, so if you want to see what I'm going to read. And yeah, now I feel like everybody's reading these like deep and contemplative poems in such a chill voice. I'm here to screech and talk about dry shampoo. So, you know, somebody's got to do it, right? So anyway, thank you so much. I'm going to start my little timer. All right. And so these are poems from my forthcoming collection, Department of Elegy. And I wanted to grab some poems that are available online. Um, I wanted to be you know, showing some gratitude to the online journals out there. 
So this first one I'm going to read is called um, Sudafed and Gin, and it is from the journal Rogue Agent. Um, also general content warning for all of my work. Um, there's some substance use and abuse, some mortality themes, and lots of bad decision making. So anyway, that's what we've got here. And I'm reading from paper in case you see this strange archaic item fluttering around, that's, that's what it is. So anyway, Sudafed and gin. Listen, I'm falling apart, but it was worth it. Like eating lunch too fast because you're walking or lurching on the deck of a novelty paddle wheeler you wanted to exit the moment they pushed off. These days, I'm mostly dry shampoo and concealer, but at least both are effective. Nobody's asking for my identification, but here it is. And the cashier wears a hoodie with a red polar bear dabbing. And I've run over both of my feet with the cart yet in separate collisions. I'm Neely but at least that's still a meal. It could be worse. Grad school, when we get wrecked on Sudafed and gin. Sorry, but I do wish I had more photos from back then. And not just the PVC jumpsuit or halter built of metal loops. You won't believe this, but I never thought about the future much. Lost four or so years down the hole of a blood mouth mistaken for a lake. I was dreaming of a man who ran relatively clean, like a lawnmower engine. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this is another little one. My challenge for this book was to write some smaller poems. As David mentioned in that kind introduction, I kind of go back and forth between writing lots of like prosy things, like big things, um, and then writing smaller poems. So I was kind of challenging myself. And in that spirit of like breaking the assignment, I didn't always succeed, um, but this is another little one. Thank you so much for the comments. So this originally appeared in the journal Poetry is Currency, which I really love. You can find them on Twitter. Um, and this is called An Unexceptional Face. And for some reason, I just always remember having this, this like memory of looking at the box of food coloring. You know what I'm talking about? I don't bake cookies, but I know other people do. You know, and to have like the food coloring, it's like something about seeing those colors made me really excited. So I was happy to write a poem about it. So here's my food coloring poem, everybody, yay. Okay, An Unexceptional Face. Maybe you just need a good thrashing at the hand of some obscure God who makes you feel the way food coloring in a box lit you up in the baking aisle of childhood. Or when you closed eyes in the gallbladder of car wash spinners, believing you'd been in their midst before. You spend a lot of time looking into the sky as if it's an unexceptional face passed over by a talent agency cold pond of gasoline rainbow waters, a gesture with no meaning in this particular country, but banned abroad. Maybe we're just too dirty to worship or to be worshiped. So I sometimes I come up with my titles before I come up with the poems. Anybody else do that? Like you have like the file of all the lost titles. Yeah. And then you're like, where am I going to get a poem for this one? So I wrote this one um, well after I came up with the title. And this is also, you know, in gift giving season, you may find yourself receiving a blank book um, and feel like, oh, it's a new blank journal, all the possibilities. But you also sometimes don't want to, you know, taint it with your own writing. So this is called, I found your diary and it was blank. Things were supposed to get settled, like one nest into another nest, one account licking the cheek of another, then disappearing for good. One shoe plummeting into the canal as its mate remained heel stuck. A customer dropping a laminated menu the moment the last lobster fled its tank for a sewer. 
some woman in her bathtub awaiting a blindfold. Noise in a perforated sheet of electronic drum beat. A figure spinning in fringe. Three people dressed in fake regalia weeping. Settled like a camera that did not make people feel sticky. One branch exacting a scratch like a crowd of fingernails. How did my arm taste? Was it like slapping a book open or dropping treasured photos into a soup tureen? Was it encrypted, bird burdened, hastened by concepts imagined in lab coats? Or settled like a forgettable character invented out of spite or misunderstanding? Like some hybrid fruit that looks fresh only in its Baroque plastic trap. And that one came out in the adroit journal. Thanks to them. All right, so now I'm gonna read my sonnet that's not really a sonnet. This is one of those tricks. I'm like, oh, I'm writing little poems. What am I gonna do? Oh, write a kind of, kind of sonnet. Um, and this was in the journal, The Hunger. And I do, if you've read my books before, you know that I am always writing about having a gas stove and being sure that the burners are turned all the way off. So I know that, you know, like if, if there's some people who look at other books, they're like, wow, you know, this is a book that talks about, you know, natural gas usage a lot, but I've continued it. So in case you were wondering if I was over that, I'm not over it. That and many other things. So check your burners, friends. This is called Ghost Writer. The hawk was clearly in distress. I knew this because I was too. Somehow traffic seemed to increase or get faster, mostly pickups. To this day, I still worry I haven't locked my car, shut the burner, harbored a dream of ghostwriting novels about animals, but not that hawk and not that day. My hair was dirty and in a catastrophic updo. I was wearing a sweater from 1996. It was not 1996 or even close. How I envied people who did their lives correctly, not like a sitcom with a thousand loose threads, fallings down, trains dramatically entered and departed, actual guns furious scrubbing of upholstered furniture. I'd only had a few memorable junctures that were clearly critical. I thought of this as I wrapped my hands in a sack left under a park bench. Conventional education offers zero insights. Perhaps it would feel cleaner to live up in the trees. So I'm gonna read my penultimate poem here. Um, yes, yeah, so I did mention that I didn't always write small poems and this one's a little bit chunkier. And this was on First Daily this week. I was so happy, it was like, yay. So it came out um, originally in Bennington Review and it's going to be in Department of Elegy. And it's, it's sort of a weird one. It's another one where I gathered a lot of things, um, a lot of images that kind of made up the poem. My dad always has, and I don't know if he still has it, but like this Rand McNally Atlas. And if you've only ever used Google Maps, this probably seems weird. But back in the days of yore, we had these big paper things that were like an atlas and you'd use it to figure out, oh, here's how we get to Nebraska. But I remember that it was so well used, it's almost like it turned into a cloth. So that got to be in this poem, among many other things. And thank you so much for listening. So this is my second to last one. This is called Head Orange Flowers. Are you my ghost? I asked the water bucket, the Angelus, a beard of moss grown over a statue's shoulder. The concept of true friendship, a Rand McNally Atlas so tripboard it could double as sheets for a doll bed. The answer was no. So I shoved my fist into a hill, dropped my tiny beaded purse into the mall's atrium fountain. Went back to the wing buffet, but it vanished along with a major thoroughfare and creek where I once fished illegally for legendary night bass. 
I read a novel where butterflies grew plate sized and people congregated on rooftops to best view burning woods from a distance. In the scrap cabin of my ghost, the curtains roiled with fire, not as cleansing or like a dancer with a pole ribbon, but a holy fire. Should I take some? I asked my ghost, who at this point was purely hypothetical. Should I go next? And then regretted the thought, like when I dropped a blood hue marker onto my gingham pants. It's something impossible to retract. A neighbor lamented how heaven is so greedy, but she picked all the orange flowers from our bush. If my ghost was a piece of debris, I would broom it away, but not forever. I thought my ghost was tangled in a kite, braided like a twine knot baby beside the river's bed. Thank you so much. And this is my last poem. Thanks again to all the readers and to David for having us. And so this is a dinky little one. This was in Thrush. Um, and I feel kind of embarrassed that it like has like peeing outdoors. I don't know, I'm this like weird mix of like urban and rural person. So like I write about the city and then also about bass fishing. So yeah, for all of you who also are filled with contradictions, you're not alone. <laughs> okay, this is called, Perhaps This Is For You. And thanks again. The enemy of rice is the sea. An ocean has no arm since it is an arm. No longer having to piss outdoors, I'm tame like a curtain. People miss the way things hurt. Just blame it on the barometer. Epidemic of shoplifted bikinis, articles calling every bystander a true hero. Math textbooks nix the formula for target sense. Roman candle, radish, wet paw. I misunderstood what was meant by vaudeville. It was not an act, but everything turned out okay. Thank you. What a great line to end on. Thank you, Mary. And I want to reiterate her very important message to check your gas burners. I've lived with that my whole life. Um, so that unfortunately brings us to an end. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank my readers again, Isam, Jessica, Noah, Chris, and Mary. Let's have some kind of, you know, Zoom round of applause for our amazing readers. Or, you know, reactions, hearts, whatever, yell things out in the chat. Please, please, please purchase their books, pre-order their books in some way, get your hands on their books. Um, this reading series will take a few weeks off while I refuse to have Zoom Pro for a couple of weeks, but then possibly we'll be back at the end of January, I think, we'll see. So yeah, once again, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our readers and hopefully I will see everybody next time. <laughs>